um, in terms of that is just to say that I think that that really highlights the value of this process. I think as you start to think this through very systematically, um, course by course, it becomes clear um, what is and isn't possible. So, so actually, from my personal perspective, I think that the issues that you're raising are, are a kind of evidence of the benefit of this process. I, I hope you'll agree with that. Um, I, I think definitely um, it makes sense to uh, explore the possibility of turning some of the subject clusters into electives with some teachers going down one track and some going down another, depending on what their focus area is in the course, in the program as a whole. Um, but I think you are also highlighting a, a, a problem that in all likelihood, the scope of the program is overloaded as far as the curriculum is concerned. Uh, and it is going to make sense to cut that back somewhat to ensure that there's, there's really good time to be able to go into each course in enough detail for the teachers to learn properly from it. I think when you have too many courses in a program and there's a rush to try and cover everything, the, the danger is that people end up not really learning anything from the process. Uh, and uh, you know, so either we engage with each subject in such a superficial way that, that they don't really learn much, or alternatively, the students just get overloaded because there's too much to cover. And this obviously is going to be particularly the case because these students are obviously working teachers, so they need to, um, they've got limited time each week. Um, I don't have specific suggestions about, you know, how you do that rationalization, that cutting back, because I think that really depends to a very significant extent what the internal country priorities are. What, what I would just say, and I think that's consistent with the feedback you gave, is that the, the really the key issue is to focus on, on ensuring that the teachers become better teachers, um, not just focusing on the subject knowledge. Uh, and, and so as you do that, that cutting back or, or, or reducing the number of courses they engage with, um, I, I would strongly suggest that we try and keep a, a very heavy emphasis on the actual teaching and learning practices and skills that these that, that our, our students need to acquire through the program. Um, what I would say though, also beyond that is, um, I don't think there's a reason for us to stress or worry too much about this now. Um, so I think it's, it's a good thing that we're going into the course design phase because I think this is, um, you know, what I would call an iterative process. In other words, we start with the program design then with the work that Andrew will do with you today, we're going to go into the more detail of the individual course design. And, and then once we've done that, we come back to the program design and look at all the assumptions that we've, we've based our, our program design on. And we can rethink that at that stage. So, you know, we don't have to finish one step and then move on to the next step. And, and that first step is finished. I think as we go through this process, we'll have to keep coming back and looking at all the choices that you've made. And so I think from that perspective, once we've been through the more detailed course design processes, uh, it will become easier for you to then go back to the program design and, and formulate the objectives and so on and so forth. So, so to be very clear, from my perspective, I didn't see it as problematic that you hadn't been able to finish all of worksheet one. Um, I think that's quite normal in this process. Uh, but as long as we keep moving forward and as long as we keep plugging the gaps as we go, and most importantly, uh, this issue that you've raised, I think as long as we get very clear what the limitations are of what we'll be able to do with each student in each semester that they are engaged in the program, I think the, the more clarity you get on that uh, and the, 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 the more contained we can keep it so that we don't overload the students, I think the better the final program design will be in the end. Uh, if I can just add a little bit, um, you've got a section on education, which is your uh, obviously your teaching method and your the pedagogy uh, ideas, and uh, I, I think that's good because um, there are various elements which are generic across all the different content subjects that you've identified here. But I also go in with Neil and say that, um, for example, mathematics course itself mustn't be just maths 
um, how do you teach, uh, how do you do maths is how do you teach maths must be a component within that particular course as well. There are particular ways, for example, that we can encourage good maths teaching, and that should be in the maths course as well, and it's specific to maths, you know, so that type of approach. I don't think there should be a separation between the uh, training them on pedagogy and training them on their subject. They should be integrated. Um, Andrew, do you mind just switching your screen on, your, your, your video on, no. so people can see you? Um, so we've got everyone joining now. I just want to introduce my colleague, Andrew, uh, Andrew Moore, uh, who I've requested to come and facilitate today's session because he is uh, a specialist in course design. So Andrew actually works with me. Uh, he, he's based also here in Johannesburg in South Africa, uh, and he's part of my organization. And he's much more competent than I am. So I thought we should get his uh, inputs into this, this next workshop. So that's just by way of introduction. So when you, when you heard Andrew talking, that's who he is. He's going to facilitate today's session on course design. Um, maybe then before we go into that session, uh, Abdir Isak, do you have, or anyone else, do you have any responses to the, uh, the comments I've made or does that all make sense to you? It all makes sense. Thank you. Uh, we will keep going back and forth, uh, as you said, and we will keep on plugging where, where we think that we will be able to do at that particular moment. And I'd like to thank uh, Andrew. He, he raises a good point of uh, integrating teaching particular subjects into the uh, syllabus of that subject. So, for example, teaching mathematics and, and, and um, you know, uh, uh, the methods of teaching mathematics should be incorporated in, in, in the syllabus, uh, along with, you know, the, the general pedagogy that we will be teaching. Uh, we accept that and we think that's a good point and we should do that and we will. Thank you. Okay, excellent. So um, just by way of summary then, uh, I'm just gonna go back to this document quickly and, and scroll through it. Um, I prepared you a, a first worksheet to, to start the detailed program planning for the program we intend to deliver, um, which everybody has uh, worked together as a team to complete. Um, there, there's obviously still a lot of work to be done on finalizing this, as, as we recognize, but I think we've made excellent progress so far. Um, and then from there, the next phase in the program planning is actually go, to go into the, the much greater detail with the design of each of the courses. Uh, and I think in response to the uh, comments that Abdir Isak has made on this worksheet, I think going into the detail of the course design will help you to decide which courses to retain, which ones potentially you might drop, which ones might become electives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Obviously, like the high level program design, there is a very specific process that we are suggesting that you follow when it comes to course design. Uh, and there's also just a lot of information um, that you can uh, take on board that I benefit from, from learning, I, I hope. So I think this is, unlike the first session, I think this is probably a bit more of a professional development session as well. Um, from the perspective of time, uh, I think Andrew, uh, am I correct in understanding that we're looking at a session that will will run for about two hours? Um, yes, it's <laughs> it's a case of a ball of string. Um, there's a lot that I would like to touch on today, but um, yes, we can uh, easily fill two hours um, with what we've got. So, so, so I suggested a, a two and a half hour session um, for this. I hope that will be okay with everyone. Uh, before we get going, uh, Abdirisak, uh, I think we'll take a, a brief break at some point. Uh, just in terms of logistics from your side, uh, from the Somali side, are there any specific breaks, for example, for prayers uh, or something else that we need to factor in in terms of timing? Or should we just take a, a, maybe a 10 minute break somewhere at a logical point in the discussions? Uh, Any time is, is, is fine with me. I can go for two, hour, two and a half hours now. But uh, let's ask Mahmoud Raghi, when is, is the Asr prayer? I'm sure that there's going to be uh, some prayer in about two or 
two hours or two and a half hours. I'm not sure. Uh, Mahmoud, Raghi. Yes, Abzal. What time? What time do we take a break? Uh, I think this will uh, be. I think from now to the four. I think there is a time. Uh, uh, time for prayers around uh, three twenty. Mm -hmm. Then we will have twenty minutes. Okay, so if if I understand correctly, it's one thirty at the moment. Yes. Um, and and so I think that uh, rather than taking a break for prayers at that point. Um, Andrew, let's try and make sure that we, we've wrapped up um, by around 3.15 p.m. Somali mm. time, which is 2.15 p.m. our time, which is right. about an hour and 45 minutes from now. 2.15. I'll, I'll keep you posted okay. on the time. Don't worry about that. Um, and, and I think uh, for everyone here today, just please be aware, I think Andrew's going to throw a lot of information your way. Uh, today that's my guess um, and we can have additional sessions on this topic if you would like to um, so, so don't see this as the only opportunity we have to discuss these topics let's go through what we can today and then let's um, look at the work that Andrew is asking you to do and then we can plan flexibly from there there's you know we have a very flexible agenda we don't have to uh, stick to any fixed um, program of activities. So let's just see how far we get today and then uh, I'll liaise with you all to work out what the best way forward is in terms of um, ex next sessions. But as long as we keep moving forward with the planning uh, and keep completing the worksheets to the best of our ability, that really is the highest priority at this point. Um, I've heard separately that the, the goal is to get the program design now completed uh, and to the bank board during uh, early next year by about January or February. So I think we've, we're making great progress in, in doing this planning. It's almost ahead of schedule. But on the other hand, as we see, there's a lot of work to be done. So the, f the more progress we can make, the better. So with that introduction, let me hand over to Andrew. Uh, and Andrew, um, the floor is yours, so to speak. All right. Uh... I want to share screen and I'll just go in here. All right. Um, okay. Th uh, thank you very much for um, having me uh, do this. I'm coming in a little cold. Uh, you guys have uh, Neil gave me a good briefing, but um, yeah, obviously there's some nuances which I'm not up to speed on. So please feel free just to uh, interject and ask for clarification or just slow down or no, we know all this, please skip this bit, etc. cetera. So um, uh, yeah, uh, feel free to interject at any point and um, change the structure. We don't have to go in this particular approach. Um, but I've tried to do the same idea as Neil did last week, uh, where uh, he laid out the types of things that he would like you to consider and to think about, and then to give you a little task. So we've also got a task later on in this session, and then a, a task that can run uh, uh, up to the next workshop. So on the screen at the moment is the little learning management system course that we've put up and uh, you'll notice there's all the materials from workshop one so you still have access to all of those things if you want to go back and uh, reflect etc but now the materials i'm going to use is in the sec second se session workshop two and i've tried to do the same thing where i've laid out a little learning pathway for you guys to engage with so all the resources you will need will be in there please remember that uh, you got in there last time uh, so try out your username and password again. The, the link is in the uh, chat, so you can go in, but it will ask you for your username and password. If you're struggling, let us know, and we will have a fiddle in the back and try and uh, uh, give you a new password. All right. Um, so uh, what is my brief? What am I trying to um, achieve? So let me get up my little PowerPoint. Just to give me a little bit of structure. Um, I don't know. Can you see the PowerPoint at the moment? Because in Zoom, I'm never sure what you can see and what you can't. We can see something, but the screen is a little 
is blank at the moment. So maybe give it a time to. Are we in the L we're still in the LMS at the moment, eh? Are you still seeing the LMS? All right. Give yeah. me a second. This is the weird thing with Zoom. It shows stop, you all... stop the share and start a new one. Stop. And let's go with this one. Right, that's much better. All right. So um so what are we up to? So um, basically, we've had already had a little overview of workshop one and where we got to. Neil's done that for us. And I'm going to um, give you um, an introduction to course design. So last week, you were thinking very much at a curriculum level. We're not going to abandon any of that. If anything, we're going to just extend it slightly and start going deeper down into what this means in terms of course delivery. All right. So um, I'm going to uh, call up in a moment that graphic you had of the curriculum, uh, how it's organized and shaped, and then I'm going to show you how the course component actually fits in. Then I'm going to run through a little learning pathway on some of the basic principles of learning design. All right, so um, what is learning design? How, how does it um, impact on what you've done already? And what are the new things you need to start considering? So we'll have a look at that. And um, I'm even going to show you um, a, a little learning pathway. There's a tutorial which we've already put together for um, various other groups on this issue. And uh, we'll, we'll take it a little way, but then you might want to play with it some more um, later on. However, I'm going to go on big. My big thing is about constructive alignment. So if some of you already know about that, then you can just nod knowingly. Um, but basically, I'm going to be asking for your objectives, your um, course activities, and your assessment to line up perfectly when you are organizing your courses. So therefore, your curriculum document is very important in terms of providing the structure. But then your course curriculum document or I call them maps, must show how those pieces all hold together. So it's not a case of just brainstorming some stuff to stick in your curriculum. I'm going to say it must all be aligned constructively, and I'll show you how to do that. Uh, applying the principal section, then I'm going to give you an opportunity to do it yourself. All right. So using some of the using the curriculum document you already started working on, you're going to push that section on course overview a bit deeper. All right. And yeah, hopefully then we'll close and we'll decide what uh, we would like you to have ready for the subsequent the workshop three. All right, so that's basically it. Who am I? I'm, I don't know, I'm a dog's body. If you wanna know a little bit more about me, there's a link to my LinkedIn. You can find out the types of things I get up to, but I've been very fortunate over the years to um, be involved with a number of oh, course man. development projects. Um, so uh, with UNESCO, uh, we've even mucked around, as you saw last week, with World Bank, etc. And um, so therefore, the experience that we will, have got has actually come from an, a, a number of different developing world contexts. We realize that the developing world is very different from resource-rich countries. So I'm hoping the suggestions we give you are, are appropriate. But if, you're there, if there are issues that we're not thinking about, you need to raise them. All right, so that's me. You can see I live in the roof. If you look, you know, it's gone. Um, the, there we go. I live in the roof. I'm in South Africa. And um, yeah, the, uh, hopefully um, <laughs> that impacts positively. All right, here we go. Um, so wh what are these learning design principles? We're going to have a... Um, I'm going to come up with four. I'm going to champion four things I think you really, really need to integrate deeply into the all of those subjects that you've identified. Uh, uh, when they start to manifest themselves as a course, then I want these four principles to come through. I'm going to talk about them in some detail in a moment. However, you need to appreciate that there is quite a big field out there in terms of learning theory. All right, is there isn't one model which kind of fits everything. So we're going to give you just a very small taste of all the different theories out there. And maybe in time, you'll find one that you think uh, you would like to champion. Um, but we're also going to look at design models. We will look at very briefly at three. And also course development models. Some of them are very well known. Some of them are a bit obscure, but I'm going to show you two and show you how they fit together. There's my thing on constructive alignment, and then we're going to have a practice. 
All right. Do you remember this from last week? All right. The um, and this is where I want to show you how what the work you've already done now feeds into the next section. So um, you might remember that when you're designing your curriculum, you've got to think uh, at a very high level, obviously, how do all the pieces fit in? The discussion we were having at the beginning about um, have we got enough notional hours per subject? Um, how much is a uh, a realistic workload for the students to be able to manage uh, are, are all things that we have to come up with during that curriculum uh, phase. However, they're not thumbsuck figures, as you right, might remember. Uh, we said there are accreditation bodies. What are they requiring in terms of the curriculum? National policies, of course, uh, have to be considered. And uh, what are what if you're offering a qualification attached? What are the prerequisites or or uh, final outcomes that have to be in place in order for the qualification to be awarded? These all need to be thought of up front. And um, obviously, uh, if we are in a country where there are problems, then those need to be. As well. However, once we've moved past that and we start working on that, then those are things which are now looking into how do we actually deliver this curriculum? All right, so we're looking at things like um, what is your approach to teaching and learning? I'm going to talk about that in a moment, uh, a bit deeper. What is the pedagogy that perhaps we should be pursuing? Um, what are what is our what what is the deep outcome that we are trying to achieve. All of these courses and qualifications are designed to achieve something, but what? And have you clearly defined what it is that all of this studying and materials development is designed to achieve? What is it you want? Okay. So, and, um, is there a section of content? Uh, which has to be covered for some various reasons. And more importantly, are there any competencies? I say more importantly, that's my bias. Um, I'm a big one for competency-based learning. Uh, are there any skill sets which uh, need to manifest themselves? So all of that needs to come up front, okay? What is the assessment strategy? It's quite low down on that list. Um, I would say that should almost be in line with the above uh, uh, orange level in that diagram. So um, how are you going to know that your students have acquired the competencies or the knowledge that you have uh, said that is so important? And uh, as you work again down that blue side of the graphic, um, you'll see there's all these different uh, assessment approaches, formative, summative, diagnostic, et cetera. Uh, how are you in a feedback loop with the students so they can continue to grow and develop? And then how are you recording and reporting their progress? So all of those things also need to be part of your curriculum document and will impact on how we actually develop the course. On the, R, uh, the green side, it's um, what are the pedagogy? What is the uh, approach that you're going to go for? Teaching and learning methods. Are you going to embrace independent study? or is it more of a cooperative, collaborative approach? Um, is it work-based? Is it specifically designed so that they can transfer the skills immediately into a specific workplace environment? And um, what type of individual support are you gonna provide the students, okay? So, and finally, that all ties up with, uh, well, the, it's supposed to tie up with the center column, which is the purple one, all right, so what are the course materials, the course activities that actually align with all that? And then we come out the bottom um, uh, with hopefully the product. And you can see here, they've also got some type of monitoring and evaluation uh, as part of the process. So um, when you are looking at your curriculum, you are talking about all of those things, but at a very high level, and your curriculum document should touch on how all those pieces fit together neatly. What we're going to look at today is then how do they manifest themselves in some type of course delivery? All right. So that's the that's the connection between last week's and this uh, the last workshop and this workshop. All right. So I said I was going to champion just well, actually, there's five on that screen. 
uh, five uh, learning design principles. And um, the, the, you, you, you'll see later where they come from when we look at the different learning theories. But I feel one of the big problems we've got with many of the courses that we are developing for educators at the moment is that we are very didactic in our approach, all right? We, we tend to try and replicate what we were exposed to when we were uh, uh, um, young learners. And um, in many ways, it's now very clear that that approach is very inefficient and it doesn't scale well. It loses quality very fast as soon as you try and scale it. Um, there is, um, it, it, the, the, a big problem with resources as well. It, it becomes very unequal uh, and when, generally it's just inefficient. So I would say when we're designing our courses, we should need to now champion some new principles which tie into our 21st century skills and all those uh, new ideas about how learning uh, can be improved or enhanced by the develop the design of our course. So number one, I would say that we got to get away from children being um, passive, just sitting there supposedly absorbing whatever the, the teacher up front is trying to get across. So um, I would say we need to have a lot more activities in the course design so that students are active learners. They are um, engaging with the content or the skill sets that the teacher is uh, encouraging them to embrace. So the idea then is, um, and that's, that's another problem with our exam system, is that we keep, we, we keep dumbing the exam down to how much can they remember? We very much, the exams are predominantly about comprehension, okay? And we gotta get away from that. We gotta now get to a, a situation where that's the least of interest to us. We are more interested in how the students apply the knowledge or um, uh, implement the skill sets or et cetera. So I'm gonna, um, kind of make a big plug for activity-based learning. So when we design our courses, we want to see evidence that the students are doing things other than just trying to read documents and review videos. All right. Um, and which leads into the second principle. So when you're designing a course, I would say the next thing that you should be trying to do is take the attention away from the teacher and place it on the student. In the end, learning happens in the student's head. It's not, doesn't happen anywhere else. Um, the teacher is merely a conduit through which the learning can uh, be shaped and take, um, take root. The idea then is that the students need to be engaged. They have to feel responsible for their own learning and um, uh, even have some influence over how the learning should be shaped. So we're going to talk uh, what the big impact of this for our teacher training is that we've got to get our teachers away from trying to hog the stage, but rather train them so that they begin to um, use strategies whereby the students feel empowered and that they feel engaged and that they feel that they are responsible. We're not getting away from that. Uh, uh, and therefore the center of the learning process is happening on the student and not on the teacher as has been the emphasis in the past. Uh, third item is that ideally um, the learning should be collaborative as well. We very much on independent learning and our exam situation even kind of encourage us to think of all the learners as individuals and that they're gonna have to uh, write the exam on their own anyway. Um, without help or without uh, any contribution from external to themselves. And yet the reality in the world is that very few people work like this. We tend to be part of teams. We tend to be part of um, uh, a group. And therefore, uh, we don't give them the soft skills in the school situation to actually do that well. So again, our teachers need to encourage their learners to um, start thinking and working collaboratively and being good team players as well as, yes, they've got to be individuals, but they need to be part, uh, a significant part of something bigger. Um, 
Number four is about being contextually relevant. So the next thing I'm going to be, do a big plug for is that um, a lot of our subjects have become very conceptual, very abstract, uh, especially at the secondary school level, uh, where we're tending to become very generic uh, in the way that we tackle our subjects. And the reality is um, we want these skills and knowledge sets to be appropriate for where these learners are going to find themselves. All right. So therefore, um, we need a lot of regional, national, and even better, local, even a city-wise, maybe it can even be a district or a community where we actually show the relevance of what we are teaching within a very specific context. And so that the for the learner, it becomes much more real. It becomes something that they can see the apparent value in, something that impacts on them every day. Um, and um, this takes a bit of thinking because there is no textbook which tells you, oh, for this community, you must do it like this. Obviously not. So um, we would like you to start thinking of these, training these teachers so that they begin to think of ways to ground the learning in something that's very familiar, something that's very real, something that uh, impacts on their life anyway. All right. And then the fifth one, I'm not going to go on too much about it. I'm afraid this has seamlessly disintegrated into uh, everything that I do. I feel that if possible, and I know some countries it's harder than in others, we should start thinking of a role for technology. Um, as time goes by, it's very clear that technology now has a role to play within education um, and um, the problem with many of our curriculums is that they don't mention technology at all. They just carry on thinking very much about the subject uh, and um, don't think about how technology is changing those subjects in the real world, in the working world, and therefore should also change uh, within the way we teach it. So I would say we need to start thinking about how can technology play a role in the delivery of these courses and in the way our teachers teach. Are there any questions or queries? Nothing in the chat so far. Please feel free also to add comments in the chat, everyone, if you'd like to. Um, Andrew, obviously, just to, to double check that you're, you, you're clear that uh, the program delivery of this is a blended learning program design. So already, oh, uh, cool. The, the program will be delivered By predominantly tablet. using tablets or, or you, you would have picked that up through the program worksheet. Okay, right. So my last, my number five is, is something that uh, when we're designing our curriculums and organizing our courses, Obviously, then we've got to integrate how does our technology enhance what we're doing and not just replicate what was done previously. All right, so we've got to think about how, what role the technology can play in making it as best as it can be and even better. All right. Any other, uh, let me just have a look. I've got my chats closed for some reason. Let me just get it open again. All right. Um, so I'm going to just try and go over some of the some of the ideas. Where did those principles come from? So I'm just going to be using some graphics of a learning design um, tutorial, a learning pathway we call them, um, which um, might make it a bit more visual so that you can see um, what I'm talking about. And um, also we can go a little bit deeper on some of those issues. Okay. All right, so here's my, my four principles plus the technology one. Um, Activity-based learning, um, uh, a learning style that requires the students to do. All right, so it's a simple way of thinking about it. What can we make them do other than just sit there passively? Student-centered education, despite a long history of lecture-based education where the focus is on the teacher, educational research advocates adding opportunities for students to be at the center of learning. So again, how do you do that within say a maths lesson or Arabic or something? Uh, those are very much taught with the expert up front, but there are ways. So you've got to think about how to change the locus from the teacher to the student. Collaborative, 
Um, we should create opportunities for students to collaborate. And it's more than just group work. The traditional group work is fine. It's a good start, but we need to get it much beyond the old fashioned idea of little group, group work. Uh, contextually relevant learning, again, the idea that we must try and locate it as close to home as possible to make it real and to make it meaningful. All right, so but, but before we go any further, let's just have a quick look at some of the uh, educational research that has come out. Now, um, it's a very exciting field, and um, uh, but, but basically what I'm picking up is the well-known uh, pieces rather than the latest, latest stuff. But the, the thinking here is that um, one of the assumptions was made, let me get the picture nice and big. Can you see that? Um, one of the uh, assumptions we've made as educators in the past is actually now well and truly been refuted. All right. The whole idea that we are, if, if we can just provide the students with enough content, uh, therefore they are going to be in a better position. And the reality is people just don't learn like that. All right. This idea that um, they can... Um, remember stuff and they remember it for an exam and then they go out in the world and they'll remember it forever. It just doesn't work like that. All right. So um, especially if the, the pieces of information that we're training them on um, are what this lady calls um, unconnected, then we're going to forget it very quickly. All right. So she says new ideas have to connect with what's already there, like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. So uh, again, another Another ref, ref, refute, another way that didactic teaching is not great is because it tends to have this idea that we're just filling them up with some ideas. When in reality, as our teachers need to be finding ways to create connections between what they already know and what we are trying to teach them. All right, so the, uh, the way we would teach, therefore, needs for them to be able to identify prior knowledge and things that they already know and what does that mean in light of the new information that we are giving them? Um, so they'd say that ideally we should be using metaphors. We should be connecting ideas to other ideas and everyday things. We should try and be multimodal, all right? Uh, what they mean here is that uh, try and find different ways to tell the same story. And it's amazing how these different ways might connect with different students. So, um, uh, multimedia, for example, some people like the visual representation. I'm one of those people. If, you, if I can see it, I'll remember it. But others are quite different. Other people feel they want it all nicely written up and structured in a text. Um, and other people feel that, no, they need to play it out. They need to role play it or think of a way that it would um, manifest itself in their community or something like that. So again, got to make these connections. How do we help the students make connections? Uh, and then we've also got to be able to help them um, um, reject ideas, things that they've maybe clinging to as something that, that was important in the past, but now is actually a misconception. Then how do we help them unpack those things? So it's really, it is about trying to join the dots, trying to get people to um, learn by adding things to what they already know. Um, so links to prior knowledge would be useful. Um, I'm just gonna, there's a little, a couple of case studies and things in here which demonstrate some of those ideas. Um, and then the other trick is when we're designing our courses, we tend to just fly from one uh, subunit to the next subunit to the ne next subunit, and we just link them all together. So even let us looking at the curriculum document that you're already working on, there's all these explicit but separate pieces. They don't necessarily link together. And this is um, one of the problems we've got. Uh, because that's not how people learn either. And what we're discovering is that in order for it, information to be retained, it needs to be constantly revisited as well. If you don't revisit something and you just rush on to the next piece, then it falls off the back of the truck. All right. So um, the use it or lose it uh, idea. Let me get that nice and big for you as well. 
Um, so the research is showing that uh, when we're designing our courses, um, we need to find a way that we can go back and look at things that we've already covered and maybe add to or build on top of. So um, the little diagram, the little graph on the screen there is basically saying, um, how regularly should you come back to something and then help restructure it or add a new node to it or whatever. Uh, so you can see there, uh, there's those review moments when they come back to something and in time it is built into memory as a permanent item. All right, you might remember there's a discussion of short and long-term memory. I don't know if you've come across those little nuggets on the uh, on, uh, uh, on the YouTube or somewhere. Um, but basically they're saying that um, our short-term memories is pretty efficient, but it doesn't hold things for very long. What the trick of the teacher is, is to make sure that the students take it from short-term and find a way to uh, put it into long-term memory, which will serve them for a longer period, but not indefinitely, unless you revisit it from time to time. Okay, that's called the spacing effect. And then this is something, again, which is uh, coming through in the research, is that people remember things better and are simulated into their long-term memory if it is meaningful, if it is deep, all right? If, if it is just something superficial that they're in class, they just touched on it briefly, then it'll just disappear into the ether. It's not something that's going to uh, be retained for very long. Um, and this particular um, page just simply says that um, we need to find little strategies to help students begin to make deep connections with some of the materials that we feel is are important. And uh, uh, Neil was mentioning right at the beginning that one of our problems with our curriculums and uh, is that they're just too big, all right? There's just too much stuff. Uh, we're getting to a point now where we're thinking of more and more things to stick into the curriculum rather than less and less things, which we can go into much deeper. All right. So the, uh, that's one of the crimes of the curriculum developers is that they're tending to bloat the curriculum rather than give space where people can engage meaningfully with uh, the content and build these deep connections. Um, is one of the one of the big problems um, that that we are facing in this modern age. So again, uh, one of the, uh, one of the things is when you are uh, there was a discussion earlier that perhaps we should be amalgamating various subjects into one, which is fine as long as you don't try and carry everything that was originally linked to it and now push it into another one to make it like a super big subject all right the idea is you should be identifying what is key and critical um, which uh, pieces of knowledge or skill sets uh, are paramount and then they should be given some space so that they can dig down and actually in the course develop the develop uh, meaningful connections around those items hi uh can i ask you a question uh andrew yes when you talk about uh, making learning on a deeper level, level, are you are you suggesting or alluding to experiential learning? Because how do you make uh, an experience deeper or a learning deeper for all students? Isn't that a bit individualized? Um, in the end, the learning is happening in the individual. Um, it's up to the teacher, though, to decide how how individual can they make the, the, the learning within a class? So if you've got a class of 60 people, then to come up with 60 different ways of experiencing something is absolutely not gonna happen, all right? But there's no doubting that if you give some of the locus of power to the, to the students to say, now, how would you like to approach this? Uh, remember, we were saying we should take the center away from the teacher and give it to the student, then a lot of, uh, in time, as students begin to realize that they are responsible for their own learning, then they will find a way to actually go deeper and, and have an experiential impact on what that thing is. So I would say, ideally, yes, we would like to have 
that deep individual experience of of the item but it's up to the teacher to come up with a strategy that will work for everyone in the class as best they can and sometimes that will mean working collaboratively rather than individually on something uh, so that's why our our teacher training needs to make sure that those four principles are kind of in front of them when they're designing their lessons or as our teacher training colleges who are putting together the support for training these teachers that that is very clear as well in their training so <laughs> I, I ducked I sidestepped you there so yes but with a caveat thank you thank you Okay, are there any other queries or questions? Do you agree with me or am I a hippie? Do you think, hey, this guy's an idealist, he's on cloud nine. What do people think? No, 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 I, I, I do agree with you. I mean, it's not possible to have, uh, you know, ex experiential, experiential learning on a 100% level for all students, I know that. But then it, it depends on, on how you design the course in the beginning mm. with, you know, the students interests and needs and difficulties and abilities in mind if you have those things in mind first then you might be able to 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 provide a learning on a deeper level the and i think that's why we've got to get our teachers away from the traditional idea that they are totally in control and i mean i know from my experience that class when i was a teacher i was a high school teacher for some years that a lot of effort went on to classroom management just maintaining control of that particular class because they were bored and they were causing trouble and they were um uh, distracted with other social things that were happening etc and uh, i would say a lot of my energy and creativity went into just maintaining control so we've now got to get our teachers to realize that part of all that shenanigans is because they're bored. All right. So if we can get our teachers to realize that they need to set up engaging, exciting, interesting um, environment where the students begin to enjoy the subject for the subject's sake, rather than just because they need to pass, then I think we will get to a place where experiential learning and these more progressive ideas uh, uh ways of learning uh can happen and i know it's it sounds idealistic um i, I would be horrified if my younger self could see my older self um because that wasn't my approach when i was a teacher so um i'm thinking our teacher training needs to now embrace and try and give our teachers confidence and some strategies so that they can begin to make this transition from a very didactic approach to a much more progressive teaching strategy. Sorry, I, please feel free to like shout me down. If you've, I mean, you guys have been in the classroom, you know what it's like. What do you think? It's, I've got it. Yes, yes. You, you're right. You're right. Uh, it, you know, being idealistic is, is not being realistic, but then we have to be idealistic so that we can get some of the stuff uh, done. So being idealistic helps. If we don't provide structures and training for our teachers at the teacher training college level, we will never make this leap. So I'm thinking, therefore, that when you're designing your teacher training uh, curriculum, there needs to be lots of opportunities where they experience how do you do these progressive teaching strategies? Otherwise, they will just fall back to what they were, what they experienced when they were kids, and it'll just become the same old, top-down, pedantic, uh, didactic approaches to teaching, which we know is deathly for the students anyway. So yeah, okay, cool. Any other feedback? All right. So where did those four ideas come from? Okay, I mean, did I just pluck them out of the sky? So the answer is no, we've had to think about this. So on the screen at the moment is, let me just make it slightly smaller so it fits. Okay, you don't, um, okay, it might be a bit too small now, but the idea is um, the field 
on how do we learn. One of the things is very clear is there is no one way that people learn. Okay. Um, people learn in multiple different ways. They might, and um, our teachers need to be a little bit aware that there isn't one model fits all. So uh, not that they would have to learn all of this stuff, but you can see that um, the four principles come from those slightly shaded schools of thought. Okay, so the pink, pinky orange, if you can see it, there's like a shadow around some of those learning theories. Um, those, so it's not like one school of thought has championed these four or five principles. The, um, they are actually not necessarily universal, but they're quite common in terms of them popping up within these various different approaches to learning. Some of those names are quite famous. Okay, you've heard of Gardner and Bloom, perhaps, Bruner, Vygotsky, Piaget, Dewey, Montessori, uh, Freire, etc. Um, let's have a look anymore. Okay, but there's plenty. All right, so um, the the takeaway really is that um, while there is no one particular approach to how people learn, uh, for example, those ones I showed you earlier, those little charts, they're really from the uh, cognitive scientists. All right, so it kind of sits within the specific camp. But those four principles can be drawn from multiple different approaches. All right, so um, again, I just feel that you guys should be aware that it's a big field and there's a lot going on um, and there's some of it which has become canon but for all the wrong reasons um, and I would say a good curriculum design and some good courses would um, uh, pull on those particular principles from those particular camps. However, it's up to you to decide. It's your curriculum. You can decide if there's an area that you feel should be further championed. All right. Um, let me just have a look. No, I think that's enough. I think you got the idea. Um, if you want to go and have a look at it, it's a really nice um, site, that one. You can go on it and you can click on those little um, colored buttons and then you can get some more information. So you really can go down the rabbit hole quite far just on that one website. So if, if you feel you'd like to have a look, you can get this, um, this tutorial um, from the LMS. You can just click on it. I'll put it in the LMS and you can go in and have, have a little look. Um, so yeah, there we go. Um, the, the, uh, I was talking about some things have gone into canon um, and you might have heard of uh, people trotting out, oh yes, we've got um, behaviorism, cognitivism, constructivism, and just lately people are talking about connectivism, all right, so all the is isms are fine, um, and again, we wouldn't say any one particular ism is more important than the other, but there are elements from all of them, even the old 1950s behaviorism still has some merits in terms of how we design our courses, so uh, I wouldn't throw it out, but I'd definitely don't think it's particularly useful for us today to um, go at that at a very high level. All right, which said I, was, I said I was going to show you some learning design models. So you've got all this, I, all these ideas, you've looked at the theories, you've adopted some principles, which I've kind of told you to. Uh, and now what? How do you actually start designing your course? All right, so we're assuming we've looked at the curriculum and now we are developing a maths course for teacher trainers, etc. And it's going to be using some technology. But then how do we organize it so that it's particularly useful? I mean, those four principles are cool, but how do you do it? All right. So um, that's what this little section is on. It's what are the different learning design models? Now, again, we've just chosen three. But um, there are many, many, many. And, um, I'm working now with a university in South Africa, and I've trotted out these three. And I went, no, we don't want those three. We've got our own. And of the ones that they offered me, one of them I had never heard of. So um, I mean, it really is a lot out there. The, um, and you need to find something that would works for you. But I'll just show you these three. It's a good start. And um, some of them are very famous. 
and others are a little bit obscure, but um, the, we're going to look at these three. Um, and so when we're looking at our course design, I'm going to show you in a minute when I, <laughs> I stop talking, um, how you can then develop your course using one of these models or uh, creating your own model using components from here. All right. So um, a, a well-known one is the nine events of instruction. And basically, it's a step-by-step -step approach. Um, we're going to look at first principles of instruction. We're, we're going to do them very superficially today because today is just getting you some exposure and giving you a little bit of practice. Um, but we will have a look at these models. And the last one is a bit different. It's, um, uh, it's called a motivational design model. It's kind of putting the students' motivations first, and then you organize all the other course content around it. So that's an, a nice departure. So here's the first one. This one is Gagne. I call him Gagne, but I don't I think I'm the only one uh, who calls him Gagne. A Gagne, a Robert Gagne, nine events of instruction. So um, this is a little bit old fashioned in the sense that uh, these, these nine events are controlled by the teacher. So the idea then is uh, it's very teacher centered. They have to coordinate all nine events to, in order to make it work. Uh, it doesn't mean that the students are without any agency, but um, you'll see just in the way that it's set up that um, the teacher is still extremely central to the, whole, the way the whole thing uh, holds together. I'll just give you this graphic. It doesn't move. Um, and he would say, basically, if you are setting up a, a, a training course or a, a, a training initiative, if you've got um, a little course that you're running, it should more or less follow these steps. So he says, number one, you need to get their attention. You need to do something provocative or um, something that's problematic or maybe uh, um, uh, ask them to solve a problem which seems insurmountable initially. And then you say, right, uh, these are what I'm trying to achieve as part of my course. So you give them the objectives. Then you test to find out what they already know. So you look, uh, you set up a strategy to do prior, prior learning. Um, you can then, if necessary, provide them with additional content. So that's kind of traditional teaching where you would give a little presentation or a lesson or something like that. But then you ask them to start thinking about how they would implement that. How would they use the information? So the students, um, initially, you provide them with some guidance as the instructor or the teacher. And then you give them an opportunity for them to practice and to try it out. Um, then they should provide you with some feedback. There's some type of assessment performance. And then you uh, check to see to what extent uh, they have retained any of the information. And very importantly, you start testing to see if they can transfer the information or skill sets to new contexts. All right. So the idea then is, is it transferable or is this something they're going to lose as soon as they write the exam? All right. So that's his little approach, which is very step by step. There are nine steps according to him. All right. Compare it to this next little model. The, uh, this one um, is called First Principles of Instruction. Basically, Merrill sat down, did some um, research, pulled all the models that existed in his time, and he pulled out all the universal pieces and then reassembled them into this new model, uh, which hopefully uh, overlaps with many, many other approaches. So according to him, um, ideally, Everything you do should be um, centered around a problem. Okay, so is there a real world problem that they can attempt to answer or solve? Um, ideally, the closer to home, the better. So this fits our idea of making it contextually relevant. So you could find an issue around which the students would tackle. And um, 
Then he had a phase called activation. So here, this is where he then dug around for prior knowledge. So what do they already know? And from there, from their discussions and their feedback, the teacher would um, try and determine to what extent um, they might be missing bits, which they would need to answer the, 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 the big world task or the big problem. Um, and therefore, there would be a demonstration section. So just like Gagné, um, the idea would be they would then need to uh, be provided with access to additional information which would help them solve the problem. Um, then he would ask them to apply what they had learned in the demonstration section to try and tackle the problem. And at this stage, it's kind of baby steps. So there would be a lot of support and help and collaboration between the groups to try and come up with uh, an approach to the problem. But ideally, there comes a point when they need to just move beyond the instructor, move beyond the teacher, and actually come up with a solution to the problem. And if the problem is a good one and it's local, then you could actually get the students to get out and solve it, all right, as best they can. That would be the fourth section called integration. So that's Merrill's approach. Now this works very nicely with, especially with um, skill sets and um, um, instances where they are uh, working on a competency, on a uh, on the on a doing, right, rather than say a theoretical. In this model, theory is very much a supporting component to to doing, all right, and so it tends to work well in the trades, tends to work well in academic subjects which uh, lend themselves to some type of application, so languages, for example, or social studies, or uh, natural sciences, or even the physical sciences. Um, you might struggle a little bit, you're going to have to be creative if you're going to apply this model perhaps to uh, mathematics or um, some of the more conceptual and abstract things, but there's no reason why a creative teacher can't find a way to do that. All right, so that's Merrill's approach to organizing a course. And then the last one I want to show you is this one. Uh, this is called ARCS, Motivational Design Model. The chap who came up with this, his name's Keller. Um, and basically, Keller says, no, to be honest, the content is very secondary to how you should design your courses. You should do everything in your power to make sure that the students feel that they are empowered and responsible for the learning. So you can apply your information as you feel fit, but basically you need to satisfy these four areas. So number one is not that different from, from Gagne Gagne and Merrill's first principles is you need to find a way to get their attention. Okay, so in, in his model, he will say things like, how relevant is this to my life? So the students need to ask that question and obviously say it is, and therefore they will be more engaged. Um, they come up with a couple of other approaches to it. I'll, there's a graphic in a minute, I'll call it up. Um, how, uh, how, do, uh, how relevant is it? Uh, how confident am I as a student to actually achieve these objectives? And once I've done it, how satisfied am I in the process? So let me just, this graphic's better. All right, uh, this graphic shows you the, the various breakdowns. So for attention, how do you in, uh, stimulate curiosity? Uh, what type of questions are you posing? Um, perpetual arousal. So once you've done it once, how do you keep it coming back? How do you keep adding some novelty and some surprise to what you're doing is how he defines attention. Relevance. Um, uh, what are the objectives that I'm striving for and why would I care? So um, how do they impact on what I'm doing? How relevant are they? Um, what are my particular needs and motives? How do they align with that? And the present content uh, 
in ways that are understandable and that relate to my learner's experience. So they must be able to see the connection between what you're training them from the curriculum and uh, what their own needs are. So that's the relevant section. Confidence is all about, can they achieve it? Sometimes we set tasks which are way beyond their ability and then they become de demotivated and dispirited. So uh, this whole section here on confidence is how have we pitched the activities so that they feel this is something they can achieve with some effort, all right? Learning requirements, successful opportunities, and what are their personal responsibilities in terms of achieving the goal? And finally, the satisfaction section is on, once we've achieved the outcome, is there, is there a reward? Um, it could be intrinsic or ex extrinsic. Um, it could be that um, you've achieved a specific, um, you provide them with some um, exposure for what they've done, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, you've got to find a way to also encourage some level of satisfaction. If you get all of those right, apparently your students are going to be completely into it. All right, uh, student motivation's very high. All right, I don't want to show you anymore. I think for now, you've got the idea. So um, I'm going to pause in a minute and, and ask you to give me some feedback. But I want to know, um, do you see the connections then? You've, your curriculum document that you're working on at the moment needs to feed into these type of principles that we uh, are beginning to identify here. Uh, once you have your principles that you are championing, then uh, you need to find a way that they begin to manifest themselves within the learning environment, either the courses that you are constructing or the, the, the activities that the teachers are giving the learners, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, an easy way to do that is make sure your teachers are aware of different models that they can use in order to achieve those particular ends. So they are linked. All three of the pieces at the moment are linked. They flow into each other and... I've chosen you just three, but there are many, many different models that you could encourage them to look at. Okay, what are people thinking at the moment? Is this a bit too daunting or is this actually quite easy? What do people think? Right, so I just pick on people. I'm thinking that the nine events of an instruction model does not go well with the principles that you have stated. Because yeah. the principles are more into active learning, collaborative learning, you know, student-centered uh, learning. And I'm thinking that the nine events of instruction model is, is pretty much, very much traditional uh, and teacher is at the center stage. So how will this go with, with, with the principles? Isn't there a, a contradiction? Um, no, we can find a home for some of the principles. I think we said it here, merits. Um, uh, the fact that the nine events of instruction model is teacher-centered does not mean it does not have any merit, all right? Uh, we particularly like how the model encourages the educator to elicit interest in the students by gaining attention with a hook or something provocative, particularly if this link uh, is linked to the real world problem or challenge. We strongly endorse the step that attempts to understand what prior knowledge exists within the student body. And when students have an opportunity to elicit performance, this ties nicely with our activity-based learning principle. So with a bit of bending, I kind of agree with you. It's the way it's written is very 1950s, very old. It's kind of linked to the previous um, the previous philosophy of education, but it's not without merit. You can bend it to suit these principles, but um, it what where it is lacking is giving students high levels of agency. So um, I would say that it, uh, that's I agree with you. Um, it, it it's so control controlled by the teacher um, that it's very easy for the students to be seen as part of a conveyor belt that they just have to go through these steps, for example. But uh, yeah, but this is this illustrates the idea that there is going to be no one model that is perfect. Um, and ideally, we want to expose our teachers to 
different types of models so that they can construct something that's specific for their context, their subject, their students, etc. Any other feedback? That was very interesting, that one. That was good. Are you guys even there? <laughs> Come, what are, what are people thinking? Is this a little bit daunting? Is this too much? Ishmael, yes. Uh, personally, uh, uh, it's just a, it's just a, uh, a reminder of, uh, I think, what we learned in, in college, and um, uh, it's good that we have you have reminded us uh, these principles, and uh, and um, and I think for those of us who will be, uh, I think, uh, designing uh, programs for teacher training, uh, is 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 uh, actually the good start is. Uh, Good, uh, uh, you know, workbook sort of uh, that we can go through, and then uh, look at it again and read and read and see what the relevance it has for, for I think for for our teacher training that we are designing, particularly the the blended learning um, uh, stuff that we are doing, and um, uh, for me actually I'm uh, uh, I find it's. Uh, this uh, stuff, these principles, the models, all of them to be very, very uh, appropriate for us. Now that I think we are uh, doing, um, uh, we have a new uh, curriculum. It's our cur curriculum meeting these uh, principles. Is mm -hmm. it? Uh, 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 I mean, both both the curriculum, the teacher, the teacher training, and also the net, the school curriculum itself. So I think it's, it's good. It's good. This. Uh, that it is a good lesson, and um, uh, and I'm actually finding it a lot of. Uh, I'll read. I, I'm looking forward to reading the the, the recorded. Uh, uh, I think uh, lecture, uh, and uh, and I was also asking myself, what what kind of model is Andrew using to give us this lecture today? Is he using <laughs> Gagne? <laughs> Very meta. <laughs> yeah, Very yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I'm afraid uh, this. Yeah. First it is very old-fashioned. I yeah. admit I'm going to get you to do stuff, so there will be some activity in a moment. Yeah, uh, I'm afraid this first part is very traditional. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's that's good. So um, I was about to post that in the, in the chat place, but uh, ah. now that you have answered, it's fine. So um, I think uh, it's good. Uh, the the course looks very good, and uh, uh, look, uh, I think it's good. It would have been a good idea that we. We give ourselves instead of having three hours lecture, I think one hour lecture and another day lecture, then you give us also this kind of um, uh, notes and, um, and models. We think about it, come back again for more discussions. Uh, some of us will do some more research and then read about it again. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy also at the at the result is also uh, is, uh, is, uh, enlightening actually the class uh, is lighting up the class and. Uh, uh, is a uh, call it a good student, and um, we we will I think uh, uh, for me personally I will, I will I recommend that we break this uh, this lesson into I think two more other lessons two more other uh, uh, okay. programs we can meet and then have more discussions and the more and more activities again at the end of uh, at the end of the three or four. Uh, lectures that we have. Thank you very much. Cool. Okay. And <laughs> there any feedback from anyone else? Because um, I think it's time for an activity. I think you've got enough information and I've reminded you of enough for the activity that I have in mind. But are there any other queries or questions? All right. Um, the, the bit I'm going to skip over, I said I was going to also show you some course design models, but I think we can hold that over for another time. Um, let me just show you. Um, oh, no, no, no. Okay. No, that's because I'd have to break out anyway. So now I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to show you. I'm not going to talk about Eddie and Sam, although you must have come across Eddie at least in your uh, college 
in your college days, if you can think back to all that. But we don't need that for this next little activity because now we're going to get a little bit closer to what you did previously last week. And we're going to refine it just slightly. So let me stop sharing and share something a bit different. Uh, I want you to now see. Oh yeah, here we go. All right, so let me share again. I'm ready. All right, so um, let's see now um, where we got to last week in terms of the curriculum design and where I'd like you to go next in terms of uh, what you've just heard uh, in terms of the, the, the principles and the models and all that. All right, so if I just go in here, um, all right, so here is one of your overview documents. Uh, you are working, trying to break it down into various um, uh, outcomes, objectives, and content. All right, and uh, in this little example, you can see that there's the outcomes and the objectives, which I found very useful. So I thought, okay, now I can see what they're trying to achieve. Um, and the nice thing is for me, I like outcomes. So I love all the verbs. <laughs> I'm a verbs person when it comes to objectives and outcomes. Uh, develop teaching theories into practical models of classroom instruction, for example. Identify classroom management strategies and establish conducive learning environments, which is exactly what I've been talking about. All right. But um, the, uh, the, the, the issue, though, was that while these are quite cool, quite lekker, it's very South African term, lekker, all right? While these are um, quite, a, I quite like them, um, there isn't a crossover into this next column, all right? In fact, I'm not sure who this was who commented here. It wasn't me, but someone said, uh, this column doesn't seem to map directly to outcomes objectives column. For example, I suggest adding assessment and uh, formative and assessment summative. All right. Um, so um, the, the I would say that's what we're missing here is, I agree with that person, whoever it was, that we now need to link across. All right. And the fact that the person has talked about um, that assessment is missing is something else that I would strongly endorse. So I'm going to also just show you my constructive alignment slide. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you to do some work. Uh, I need to share again. Give me a second. Um, all right. I hope you can see on the screen. So um, ideally, as a curriculum developer slash course designer, the idea now is you need to pull those different columns closer together so that they support each other better. All right. And as the as the person who was putting comments in the document, I agree there's a section missing on assessment. How do you know that learning has taken place? All right, and the curriculum document should give us some guiding as to how that might happen. And then the course development should actually show it in, in effect. All right, so on the screen at the moment is the constructive alignment model. Um, so down the middle, the blue column is your outcomes. All right, and the constructive alignment theory uh, even stacks them, the, the more sophisticated uh, outcomes on the top, they are A, and then our not so great ones are down the bottom at D. And I've just quickly stuck uh, Bloom's taxonomy on top of it. So you can see um, that if we're down the bottom, it's all those lower order thinking skills like comprehension, et cetera, understanding, remembering. So those would be the D, D ones. And then A is at the top, which would be the creating, evaluating, analyzing. In fact, I think this is the new Bloom's, which is now um, people are hating. So, <laughs> but anyway, uh, the idea is that the higher order thinking skills are at the top. Okay. And then to balance it, to make it aligned, the yellow column is the activities the student should be doing. So what are they doing in order to achieve those outcomes? And um, a good document, a good course 
curriculum map would show us what are the linkages between the activities and what they're trying to achieve. And then the pink column is saying, but what about the assessment? How would you know that the students have actually achieved the objective through the activities? And that's why they also need to be aligned. So that's what they're talking about, this constructive alignment is these three ideas. So if we go back to our model, we go to this one, um, here's, here's just a different section of the same document, but you can see here that, that there isn't that information. We've got our outcomes, which are quite like, we've got our content, which I'm assuming is given by some, some existing curriculum document, but how do they link? How do they link together? Are there any suggestions about how it would be achieved? And how will you assess it? seems to be missing. Now, for a curriculum document, you probably don't need, need to go into that much detail, but I think the linkages do need to be more obvious. But then for a course development document, you do. You need to go into that detail. How much, how much, how, how deep down there, I keep saying it, how are those linkages going to be made before you even start developing your course? All right, so um, here's an example of what I, kind of took a part of your document and then I was trying to, is it big enough? I was trying to, um, hopefully you can see that. So I just took a little bit of the social science uh, section. The whole of social science at the moment is supposed to be 32 hours. Um, I would say then you start dividing it up into your outcomes. So for outcome number one, for want of a better name for it, Explain how the internal landforming processes take place and the impact of earth movement. All right, so I thought, okay, when I looked at the content, I could pull out at least two sections which go with that outcome. So the first one was uh, uh, continental drift theory versus plate tectonic theory. Okay, so obviously these little social science uh, students would be expected to understand what those two theories are about and folding and faulting would also exp uh, explain um, how the earth has moved etc all right but then what would be the activities for those two outcomes slash content so then i thought all right for the activities and please forgive me i was being very idealistic but i went for the different theories Students are tasked with developing a model that they must use to explain how the earth moves. They need to research and then demonstrate the theories of plate tectonics as well as continental drift using their models. And I'm thinking it, they could be physical models made out of cardboard and plasticine or cardboard and mud or who knows what. Um, uh, the models can be made from local materials but because they got tablets, why can't we make them use some type of little drawing application, which makes an animation where they can demonstrate the movements of the various uh, pressures and conduction zones, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So I'm thinking then that would be uh, an activity that would help link the content and the outcome together. And then the assessment strategy, how would you know that it's been achieved? So the model presentation should be marked. Ensure that the mark allocation or the rubric includes, does the model accurately depict those theories? So when they're marking this particular thing, they're gonna to check to what extent there's a linkage. Two, verbal presentation demonstrates uh, an a uh, proper understanding of the theory. So we're thinking then they wouldn't just be the model, the student would need to present it either as a voiceover in the animation or they can just verbally say it next to their physical model, okay? Um, number three, the model demonstrates, uh, the model demonstration and the pre presentation are articulated well and are engaging and interesting. To what extent has the student gone to, um, is feeling confident with the understanding of the knowledge uh, with their model that they can demonstrate um, the, the uh, and explain how the internal land forming processes take place and impact on earth movement, which is the objective. So um, I'm saying then that when you're designing your course, you need to go, uh, you would provide the, 
the uh, those steps in order to achieve something uh, uh, in, in your design. So that's what I'm trying to say. We need to go a little bit deeper down down the the rabbit hole. Now, if you're training teachers to do this, there don't have to be some extra stuff. You would have to say, all right. So uh, in the training for the teachers, um, are they familiar with the technology? Uh, do they have themselves an imagination of how a physical model might be constructed or worked? Do they know how to use a rubric? Um, uh, are they confident already with the theory of tectonic plates and and continental drift, et cetera. So we might have to go a little bit deeper than that. But what I'm trying to demonstrate is the idea that uh, the pieces are linked. They all go together. I don't know, what do people think? Any feedback? Uh, I'm thinking that we're going to steal this template of yours here. It's, it's done nicely. I'm very much impressed and I can see the linkages very well. Um, the, uh, admittedly, I now realize I wrote it as if I was a teacher talking to the students, but you need to be a teacher trainer talking to the teachers who are being trained. Okay, so there's a slight difference, but at least you get the idea that we need to make the linkages across um, between the different areas. So yeah, keep in mind then, constructive alignment gives you some power because all the pieces link very neatly together. And then before you build anything, you can actually show how the linkages work. Any other feedback? Do you want to try it? I've made you a template. You can actually have a go yourself. I think you should. All right, we've still got some time. We've got, we got almost half an hour. So I think it's time for you to have a little go um, and see if the template works. You said you're going to steal the template. <laughs> you got to get your own copy in a few seconds, all right? And I would like you to uh, fiddle with it. So if you don't even, if you don't like the structure or you want more, then you can fiddle with it uh, in there, all right? Let me just see if I can go back to, let me call up the, the LMS because that's where you're going to get your template. Uh, I keep losing the buttons. Okay, it's here. And I go back there. Okay, all right. There we go. All right, so this is where we were. Um, I've made you a little template here, course design overview template. I'm calling it course design rather than curriculum design because I don't think you need to go into this much detail in the curriculum document, although you do need to show linkages between the... the um, the outcomes, uh, your content, and somewhere you need to have the assessment strategy very clearly articulated and how it links to achieving the outcomes. All right, but for a course design template, I think you need to click on there. And now you do need to provide this detail because if you're going to create the course, um, it's very rare that you do it, a that there's a single person. It's more likely a team effort and therefore everyone needs to be on board about how everything links together. All right, uh, did it come up? So, um, so can you do that, please? Can everyone um, call up their own version of that template? It's an Excel spreadsheet. So um, it should open in Excel when you click on it. What happened to mine? Oh, it's here. All right, let me just share that rather. All right, so here's that uh, little section, and uh, I, I didn't get very far. Sorry, I ran out of time, and it's not mine anyway. It needs to be you guys need to take ownership and fix it and change it and adapt it as you see best. But my thinking then was this column here would go on for as, as many objectives as you've got. The nice thing is maybe then you can divide this 32 up into smaller segments. How long do you think they should take to do a little bit of research and build a little model? I've put four hours here. That might be a little bit tight, actually. Maybe they need a bit longer than that. All right, there's my outcome. But then there were two pieces of content which talked to this outcome. So in this instance, those 
work with that one, but you might find there are more. Um, for example, I decided earthquakes and volcanoes should go with this particular outcome, describe causes of earthquakes and how to measure an earthquake. Strangely, there's no outcome on volcanoes, and yet there is a content section on volcanoes. So I was thinking, okay, then obviously those must be related. They must be taught together as a group. So I've put them in there. And I think someone needs to sit down and find those linkages because that's partly what's missing from the existing document. Activities, okay. You can come out, what's my activity for earthquakes? What's the activity for volcanoes? And then how would you know? How would you know that the outcome has been achieved? It says describe causes of the earthquake. So in this instance, the, the, um, the verb is for them to articulate it. So whether they write a little document on their iPad, uh, on their tablet, or whether they um, uh, have to uh, create a little PowerPoint with images they've taken from the internet, or whether they have to um, take existing images, but then add the labels. There are many, many different ways they can describe uh, their understanding of the earthquakes and so on. But then that needs to be, that needs to be written here. What, what are they going to be doing in the course design? And then how will you know? So maybe a rubric or maybe it's a test and then it marks itself using the LMS or whatever. I don't know. That's something that, that the the curriculum designers slash course developers needs to, to think deeply on. All right, so my thinking then is I would like you to spend the next 20 minutes having a go yourself, just trying to fill out one of them. It looks easy, but <laughs> when I started, I went, oh, shucks, that's easy. I can throw that together in a few moments. Oh, actually, that goes here and that goes here. And then you're trying to actually find the relationships between all the pieces. So I would say now go and have a look at the document we were sharing right at the beginning of the session. You can just choose a piece, any bit that you are familiar with. I would say it's much easier if you've taught it before. So if you were a maths teacher in your past life, then um, I would choose the maths curriculum. Um, uh, if your languages, choose a language section and then see to what extent you can create those linkages between the between the different sections, the outcomes, the content, the activities, and the assessment strategy. Are people following? Are you okay? Can I guide you more? Thank you, that's okay. All right, do you wanna work independently or would you like to work in pairs? Because we can put you in little breakout rooms if you feel that would be useful, or do you wanna just work and talk to me as you're doing it. Should I create a, well. It might be better to do it as a plenary. I'm beginning to think there's only a few of us. Should we just try it and people can suggest and I type and they watch me and then, but they give me suggestions. Should we do it that way? Sure, yeah, that, that'd be much That's better. better. All yeah. right, that's, that way we're moving along and we won't get lost. All right, because we might as well use this time productively. All right, so which section shall we choose? Shall we just choose another section? Let me just call up that document again. Um, let's, oh no, it's workshop one. It's in that forum. Let me just grab it quickly. Here it is. Let me share that. Stop the share and share. But this time I want this document. Okay. All right. So here's that uh, document earlier that you were working on last week. And then we got to, this was the section that I found interesting. Okay, the course design overview. So let's say, for example, we go with, should we do this first one? Do you guys have a background or would you prefer science? 
It's okay, we can do that. The first one. Yeah, sure. Okay, all right, here we go. So let's say then that um, I'm, I'm gonna just go back to my spreadsheet because you're gonna watch there. All right, so I'm going for education. Oops, a daisy. Uh, we know from that curriculum document that it is approximately uh, 64 hours. All right, and our first objective is to equip teachers Oops, let's just take all that thingy out. Sorry. And I want to wrap text. Okay, and we can just push it over. All right, so now it says equip in service teachers with skills and techniques that can enhance their teaching, which is very, very broad. Okay, but we do have this content. Let me just paste it here. Learning, learning differences and learning needs, the learning sciences and constructivism, social cognitive views and learning and motivation. All right. So you can see now the linkages are not that great. Not so clear how which pieces fits with which. So I'm gonna grab another one. All right, and wrap. Uh, introduce in-service teachers to various teaching theories and practice that contributes to effective teaching. All right, and again, um, I'm struggling in my mind. So um, what should I cover when I'm trying to achieve that particular, that particular outcome? All right, based on the content. If I could choose different content, then it might be easier. So that's why I'm saying the curriculum document does need to be quite linked. So we know, oh, that piece goes with that piece rather than just making them lists. Um, let me see. And your next one is. Train in-service teachers on measurement and evaluation principles and techniques that allow them to conduct valid and reliable assessments. All right, so. Um, I would say then maybe we can find another place for this. And then maybe we need to repopulate what the content is. So for this, uh, this one, various teaching theories. Uh, there was a discussion discussion on um, learning sciences. So let's just say learning theories. And um, then we can also add, um, we're also interested specifically in uh, there's constructivism here. Um, and then we can decide if we need to link to any uh, any others. Um, and then you'd say, all right, so um, how are we going to do this? Introduce in-service teachers to various teaching theories and practice that contributes to effective things. So, all right, so now we come to our activity. So how are we going to do this? You can be quite boring. <laughs> you could say, um, um, teachers must view a series of videos on learning theory uh, particularly right as I as you know it's an enormous field so 
which learning theories are we going to expose them to, or are we going to ask them to make a make um, a review themselves? Um, and let's say for want of something better, we could say um, constructivist approaches to classroom teaching. All right, um, then they have to model uh, the strategy in a class of their own and film it using the tablet camera. All right, so we, we want them to actually apply it. So first of all, understand what it is and then come up with a, a lesson plan which uses a constructivist approach to, to learning uh, and then actually film it on their camera. So what would be the assessment strategy? So here we would say um, uh, student teachers need to submit all right submit the video of themselves teaching using a constructivist methodology Um, marking needs to provide uh, okay and then you can give the criteria or whatever so all right so that was me and he was just laughing me off but what about this next one you guys can tell me what to type now. So I want to know, train in-service teachers on measurement and evaluation principles and techniques that allow them to conduct valid and reliable assessment. Uh, if we look at here what's in this list, there's nothing on assessment in here. So you can come up with what should be in the content. So what are they, what are they going to be co covering in this section? Suggestions, please. Principles of measurement, uh, principles of measurement and evaluation. <clears throat> you want to be specific? Any, any, anyone to, that must be in there, but or anything else? Uh, we could add reliability and validity. Types of reliability. Okay, types of reliability. Uh, what else did they ask for? Reliability and validity. And validity. And validity. All right. And then what would you make them do? So that um, you're going to cover these things. How are you going to do it? Mm. Teachers will develop uh, measurement tools or devices that are relevant or context relevant, relevant to their pupils. To the pupils. Or contextually relevant. That's okay. Relevant. Yes. Okay. So that is a principle. Um, is there any specific tool that you have in mind here? Because a if test, I was building this, I wouldn't be sure what to build. Yeah. How about a, a, a quiz or a test?
something like that where they yeah, yeah. so yeah they've got to build a test and then explain in what ways is it uh is it a reliable test and in what way is the results valid so then they would obviously have to give you the context for the test so it would not just be the test you it would have to be all right i'm trying to achieve this this is the tool i've built and this yes. is what i consider the results reliable and this is why i consider the results valid that way they need to understand what those terms mean and they need to not just understand they need to know when it is reliable and when it is valid something like that we could we could add another activity yeah we could you can, you can add as many te like. te teachers will establish the 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 reliability coefficient of the of the test so they will basically doing mathematical formulas to establish the reliability of their tests uh, reliability coefficient of the test so that's yeah that's lacquer because now um, we've got something very tangible that we can mark as well so um, in terms of our assessment we, we could say that um, uh, okay ignore, ignore that uh, we could say, well, how would you, all right, I don't want to say, I want you to say, so how will you know then that, that the objective or the outcome has been achieved by doing this activity? Uh, teachers will submit. A test. Uh, teachers will submit a test. Uh, with proven uh, relevancy or with proven uh, context relevance. How will they prove though? That's, that's another question. All right. So then you probably say, all right, um, teachers will submit um, an assignment that um, shows the course outcomes they are trying to assess, mm -hmm. the tool they designed to collect evidence. I, I, I'm not saying it very nicely. The tool they designed to collect this data. <laughs> uh, by that, I mean the test. All right. Uh, yes. And the uh, reliability and coefficient, was it? Reliability yes. coefficient that was derived. Something like that. Yes. And now that way, you've got a very nice tight loop between um, between what is it you're trying to achieve? What did you cover in the content? What little activity did they do to get themselves organized? And then to what extent have you got evidence that they were able to uh, achieve the outcome? So you see what we're trying to do? We're trying to make nice linkages between all the different pieces. Uh, uh, all right and, we're and running out of, yes yes uh, i just wanted to jump in uh, someone is talking behind me um i was just thinking uh just to instill uh, i think the learning theories in uh, in the students uh for example uh, the constructivist in theory um i was thinking whether um uh and a practical lesson like a, a micro teaching lesson will can come in here in this case um, students will uh, i think uh, uh, play the play the role of a teacher a role the role of a teacher and the student students yes uh, and uh, and in that way i think we can uh, test uh, students uh, ability yeah. teaching abilities that way so i'm um, um, whether can you put in a micro a micro teaching lesson here in this in this case um, well, to be honest, this is not necessarily a lesson. 
So mm. this is rather um, a learning initiative, for want of yeah. a better word, and it yeah. can be as many lessons as we want. So yeah. we could just make the activity more detailed. We yeah. could say yeah. they have to create the tool, then they have to try it out on the teacher so they collect real type of data. Correct. Uh, Correct. And then they develop the coefficient of the test, et cetera, et cetera. Blah, blah, blah. Correct. So okay. yeah, I would say then that don't see these as lessons. They are whatever's required to achieve the objective. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they can be as long or as short as is required. So that's why I'm thinking then here, we could say, oh, this is quite long. Mm -hmm. So they need six hours for this one. But then you might say, all right, they only need one hour for this. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you're not cut. You're not stuck in trying to make lessons all the time. For five minutes or something like yeah. that, an hour. Yeah. Okay. All right, people. We've run out of time. It's now. Is that is this the time I was given? Two fifteen in my time, and I think it's three fifteen. Yes, it is. It is the end, Andrew. All right. So can we just uh, wrap up for today? Uh, what I would like you to do is have a go at doing this yourself, and then we can always come back later, and you can tell me the pros and cons of this approach. Um, but um, hopefully you can see what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure our curriculum document is tight and linked, and therefore our course development document can go into much more detail. I call it a curriculum map uh, as to how all the pieces fit. All right. Okay. So um, can you please have a go at this um, uh, choosing a section from the course overview document from last week. Have a go at filling in just a few fields here so that you're getting comfortable. It's not, not going to be your job. Um, that you're going to get content experts to do this, but you need to brief them on what you want. So you have to try it and you've got to know the intricacies of what, how these relationships need to bind. So can you please have a go? I would like you to choose a section and try and show me the linkages. So next week, we're going to get you to or when we next meet, we will, you can demonstrate to us the pros and cons of this approach. All right. Um, okay, we've run out of time. Um, I'm going to hand back to Neil to, to do a close. And uh, we'll send you some mails with all this written up so it's clear. All the resources you need are in the LMS. Okay, Neil? Thank, thank you very much, Andrew. I hope to see you again and again with, 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 with these kind of presentations. Thank you very much. This has cool. been very interesting today. Great. Thank you. Um, so, so just recognizing that we have very limited time before prayer starts. Um, what I'll just say in closing is, uh, as Andrew has mentioned, we'll send through some follow-up email to, uh, I, I, uh, to, to indicate what, what we think needs to happen next. Um, Abdir Isak, I'll also liaise with you about the possibility of follow-on sessions, which is definitely possible. As I warned you, um, in, in this session, uh, Andrew's going to throw a lot of information at you, but then you'll get the opportunity to go through it again, digest it, engage with his activity, and then we can look at a follow-up session to start going into aspects of this in much more detail. Um, so there's no problem for us to, to have a, a, a number of sessions on this. Um, I think it's going to be uh, very important. I think this is really the heart of the work that we need to do. So we, we need to invest good time and effort in it. Uh, and both Andrew and I are committed to helping that um, uh, to the best of our capability. So thank you very much, everyone. And um, we'll be in touch by email. And uh, we'll then uh, continue the discussions from there. Um, and we'll brief you on what the next tasks are. It's all in the uh, Moodle LMS as well. Thanks very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And thanks very much, Andrew, for facilitating today.